thanks so much for watching. A good tree does not bear rotten fruit, nor does a rotten tree bear good fruit. For every tree is known by its own fruit. Take care and come back. The following program is intended for your edification, and the owner of this channel does not subscribe to any rapture theories. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1. This is just an opening scripture. It's good for all time. Take a look at this. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1. Now concerning things sacrificed to idols, we know that we, have, we all have knowledge, Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. I'm reading from an interesting translation. It's called the New Heart English translation. Let me take uh, the New American. It says, knowledge makes arrogant, but love edifies. Knowledge makes arrogant, love edifies. Let me say it again. Knowledge makes arrogant, but love edifies. It's astounding to me the, the, the monumental task that God has before him to impart to us his heart, his knowledge. It's really difficult. It's really difficult to God because you imagine any little thing that God gives to a human being has the potential to puff them up and to make them arrogant. Any little thing. So the debate 2,000 years ago was he had given 10 commandments. Just 10. Can you imagine? He must have so many more, right? Many laws that, that govern the galaxies and the nebula, laws that govern the angelic life, laws that govern even how does he operate and how does heaven operate. So many things. He just says, let's try with 10. And you know what's happened? Just that tiny bit of revelation has puffed up a group of Christians that we are the fourth law keepers. You know what the fourth law is? The fourth out of the Ten Commandments, the Sabbath. Imagine, God just gave one piece of knowledge. It's not wrong, but it's not to be abused and puff you up. But for the next 2,000 years among Christians, we have a divide between some who say they must worship on Saturday and others who say they must worship on Sunday. And off we go. That The, the most... This, this most scantily tiny, minuscule piece of knowledge from God's brain has created the most horrific divisions. And God must be like, how much can I share with these beings? And so he sent his son Jesus to show that that use of the proper law was completely absurd. And so Jesus intentionally, over and over, if you will uh, study the Gospels, he would intentionally heal on the Sabbath day. And the Pharisees would freak out. What are you doing? You say you're from God. You say you're the real deal. Well, you're fake. You're fake news, Jesus. You're a fake prophet. Why? Because we know the fourth commandment. Wow. Fourth commandment. Nothing else. Nothing else about human relationship. Nothing else about love. Nothing else about healing. Nothing else about saving lives. Nope, we're fourth commandment. If you don't agree with the fourth commandment, you're not... You know that they say, not only do they disagree with you, these people who believe only the fourth commandment say, you have the mark of the beast if you worship on Sunday. That's their end time doctrine. That's the truth. Now, you know what? I can still hang out with you. I can still literally tolerate that. But they won't tolerate us. They think we're antichrist. Now, by the way, you are listening to us on a Saturday. But can I make some things plain to you? Nobody on earth keeps the Sabbath. Especially the Christians who think that they're worshiping on the Sabbath. Sabbath, first of all, by definition, Genesis 1, is not Saturday. It's Friday sunset to Saturday sunset. Almost no Christian takes that into consideration. Second of all, you're to do no work. That means when people out of the good intention of their heart say, I am better than others as a believer. I'm more refined. I'm pure in my faith because I worship on Saturday. Let me tell you, the moment you get in your car and you drive to church, you violated the Sabbath. 
because you were not supposed to do work or ignite fire. Well, guess what? You ignited an, a combustible engine. You ignited the key. You ignited the battery. You know that in Israel, they take this so seriously that women cannot cook on the Sabbath. They cannot get into an elevator because just pushing the button is igniting a fire. So you can see you're, you're in a hopeless situation. Nobody has kept the Sabbath. But am I against Sabbath keepers? Of course not. But I'm just saying, give a little grace to people who are worshiping on other days because he already said that the Lord is not into your new moon and your festivals and, and all days are holy to those who want to keep the day holy. And Jesus showed that. He showed you can do a good work on the Sabbath and he intentionally healed over and over on the Sabbath day. And the Pharisees intentionally got offended over and over because he couldn't possibly be the Messiah because he healed on the Sabbath day. Well, no, that, you just made that up. Out of one piece of knowledge from the Bible, just the tiniest grain of knowledge caused you to be arrogant and offended about nothing. Now, this in history is well known. If you study political science, you study history, you study psychology, it, it's summed up in a phrase that's commonly used. People say, power corrupts. And absolute power corrupts absolutely. And knowledge is a form of power. Knowledge is a form of power. And so people get this, and, and, and some of them will get a little tiny bit of knowledge and, and, and realize, well, maybe we should know some Hebrew culture to understand the New Testament. Well, obviously that's true. Then they swing to the extreme and say, well, anybody who says the name Jesus must be the Antichrist because his name is Yeshua. Then you, they go even further than this. Then they go from Yeshua, they have to go to Yeshua. I got, an, I got a message last week that we're all wrong. Anyone who says Jesus is wrong, anyone who says Yeshua is wrong, it now must be Yeshua. Well, first of all, let me explain something to you. The Hebrew language, the Arabic language, the Aramaic language do not use vowels. There are languages that do not use vowels or so put them in different places. Thai is one of them. When you write, the consonants go in one line, but the vowels go on top or on bottom. So the Hebrews do that, but when you write the Torah and the Bible, they omit all vowels because they figure, you should be smart enough to figure out which vowel it is. Now, most of the time that's true, but some of the time it creates confusion. And in the Tetragrammaton, uh, which is the four-letter name of God, yud he vav he there's no way anybody knows which vowels goes in between. Some prefer Jehovah. Some prefer Yahweh. So, how do we fix this? I can't fix it. If you don't listen to God's word, if you don't, don't take Jesus' example of quote-unquote violating the Sabbath by healing constantly, you're never going to get it. And you'll be into all these tangents by which the devil deceives you and, and, and rock your boat Every time somebody has a slight difference in pronunciation in the day they worship. And I know it's a big deal to people. I know it is. I, I know. People make whatever it is a big deal because it comes from their past. All right? But you got to try in this church, you got to try to do 1 Corinthians 8. It says, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Knowledge makes arrogant, but love edifies. So what we want to do is we want to be this one exception in the entire history of the world, we don't really know many exceptions. But we want to be the exception where we can gain great knowledge, great revelation, and it doesn't go to our head. And we can then, from that knowledge, some of us will, will gain great wealth, great power, great influence, and we won't be corrupt like Hillary Clinton has become. Can I be plain? You get hundreds of millions of donations from Arab countries and then you make arrangements, political arrangements that benefit them, you've been bought. This is called bribery, but it's legal. That's called corruption. Every person so far, every organization so far that has gotten a lot of knowledge, a lot of power or a lot of money end up corrupt. You want to be one of them? You choose. I'm not going to join that crowd. So when we gain knowledge in this church, we will not make it our banner. We will not camp on it. We will not hold it as a flag of, look at how good we are. Look at how much light and revelation we have. No, because we know the danger zone that everyone's gone into. 
And when we get lots of money, and people will give us millions of dollars, it will come. Because we have a vision to do something for the body of Christ, not for ourselves. We're not going to allow it to go to our head. We're not going to pocket it. We're not going to think about how do we enrich ourselves. Now, how do we give you a promise that that won't happen? We can't. So far, everybody's gone corrupt. Some of you have come from the big churches because you've seen the corruption there. Does it exist? Sure it does. Does this issue impact me? Does this issue impact us? I think it does. But not in the way that the, the people think. The people read the newspaper. They see the, the, the corruption and the shame and they get on the bandwagon of criticism and gossip. And That's not us. I want you to check your own lives. Can God give you any knowledge, any power, any money and it not corrupt you? Because if that's possible, you're the exception. You're not even 1%. I'd say it's less than 1%. Is it enough for you to be disheartened by what's going on in the church? It would be. And that's why we can't say it because, again, it's a little bit of knowledge. What will you do with that knowledge? If you find out what really went on with some of the mega churches, what would happen? That knowledge can destroy your faith. It's not nice. A lot of it's not nice. So what would you do with it? Would you be redemptive and say, would you let's pray for them? Or would you say, well, thank God we come to discover church was so much better. That's not the heart. Would you say, well, I thought church was corrupt. That's why I don't go to church. No, that's not the heart. The heart is let's make church better. Church is God's idea. This institution is God's idea. And the way that it's developed and the way that it's come to exist now, God has allowed it. And you may wish that it's different, but this is what we've got right now. So we're not to be critical and judgmental about it, but to think in our own case. What you doing? You making church better? You making church great again? Like Donald Trump says, we, let's make America great again. You can sit and criticize and the church is not only no better, it's worse. Because that kind of attitude stops your own family members from getting saved. I have so many people come to me and say, pray for my family to get saved. I say, no, I won't. Until I can know your life, your thoughts, the way you speak to your own family members, the way you speak to, and your family members means the church first, number one. And judging by the way that people treat each other in the church, it's no wonder that their family don't want to come to church. I live with this knowledge. What do I do with it? Do I, do I dismiss all churchgoers as themselves corrupt and hopeless? Cannot. Cannot, because when you sow seed, you don't know who's the good ground. You can never judge people by the external. And some people who seem very rough and gruff on the outside, they have an honest heart. God likes those people. It's okay. So we give everybody a chance. But you cannot take any knowledge that you know, whether you know private knowledge about leaders and pastors, whether you know private knowledge about congregants, church members, and allow that to corrupt you. David said, I said, in my haste, all men are liars. Remember that? Psalm 113, part of the Hallel. I said, in my haste, meaning what? I was hurt. Somebody lied to me. Somebody lied about me. And then I made a grand conclusion. Everybody's a liar. I can't trust anybody. I can't give my heart to anyone. I can't get into a relationship anymore. You're allowing the past to control you. And one thing about Christianity is we're set free from the past by the blood of Jesus. And whether your past has good knowledge or, or bad knowledge, you cannot allow that to govern your faith today. Your faith today is fresh and renewed every day when the Holy Spirit says, move this way, you move this way. When the Holy Spirit says, give, you might say, but the last time I gave, they abused it, misused it. Yeah, but you can't live by that past anymore. One thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Right? One thing, you just keep living. If you get, every day you get is another gift of God. And you can wallow in, in negativity and criticism and judgmentalism, or you can just keep pressing it, just keep doing it. Nobody's life is where it, they want it to be. Nobody. Except maybe kids. And even kids, I don't, I'm not even sure. Nobody, you don't have everything you want to have. You don't have, things are not lined up. People are not treating you with the respect and love you want or deserve. 
but every day we get is a gift. And, and God wants to impart, I know he wants to impart a little bit more. But if he teaches you Hebrew and suddenly nobody can speak the name of Jesus in any other language except Hebrew, you're nuts. Really, that knowledge has corrupted you, has made you arrogant. Because what happens to people who don't even speak English? I, I have this problem with the King James only people. And the thing is, the King James people love me because I prefer the King James. I can read King James. 1611, no problem. It's as easy to me as modern English. And it's more accurate. No problem. But then they say, the true name of Jesus is Jesus. The true Bible is the King James English Bible written in 1611 Elizabethan language. And I'm thinking... Well, I know 70 million people who don't even speak English. They live in Thailand. They come from a Buddhist background. There's no way you're going to get them to read the King James Bible. They don't even understand modern English. If you say that's the only pure, true Bible, that means you've just written off 70 million people in Thailand. Well, they don't think about that. I mean, I pressed one guy and he finally said, yeah, that's right. They have to read the King James only. I said, wow, God is so cruel. Can't even, and God is so unintelligent, can't even speak Thai. But they got no answer. They just go back because you know why? They're responding to some hurt or something in the past. And everybody does this. Everybody does this. Do you realize everybody does, does this? When you follow your favorite preacher, back in the day, Oral Roberts, Oral Roberts, healing minister, healing evangelist, came to Australia once, we so mistreated him, didn't, never came back. Healing evangelist. Why is he such an expert on healing? Why? Folks, why? Tell me. Because he was going to die of tuberculosis. So he's responding in a positive way to a past hurt. Others of you are very into a preacher in Singapore named Pastor Joe Prince. And now in Australia, there are people saying, if you don't preach grace... You're not even led by the Holy Spirit. There's nothing else to preach but grace. Well, wait a second. Let's go back to why does Pastor Joseph Prince focus on grace? Do you know why? Because when he was young, he was extremely legalistic to the point that he thought he lost his own salvation. Well, guess what? I've never doubted my salvation. I'm saved by grace through faith. I accept Jesus Christ. He did the work of atonement for me. I'm a sinner. He saved me from sin. Finished. Let's be a Christian. Let's grow up. Never had a doubt. So is grace important? Absolutely. Do we preach grace? Absolutely. We've got hours of teaching on grace. Do we preach only grace? No way. There's not one book called grace. And the, sub and the Bible talks about judgment, end times, prophecy. And the grace people can't handle it. Why? Because they're either responding to their own hurt or they've followed someone who has responded to his hurt. Am I against Pastor Joseph Prince? Not at all. He's responded to his hurt in a positive way. So he has an extreme revelation on grace, which then brings knowledge that corrupts, that brings arrogance into the body of Christ because knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. So you can even take the message of grace and give it to people who don't even know why they respond to it, they're so switched on to it, to the extreme point that they think anybody who doesn't focus only on this message must be false. You give it to these people, and they become the most ungracious Christians you've ever met. The people who are trying to tell others there's only one message, and it's grace, act in the most rude, obnoxious, ungracious, critical, self-centered way. Well, the proof is in the pudding. The proof is in your behavior. So this is it in this church and for people who are listening. If Christianity doesn't make you a better person, you're in the wrong Christianity. You've somehow miscalculated. You come to church and you're not a better person, you leave angry, hurt, offended. No, you must be better. You must reconcile. You must forgive. And look, I'm, t I'm talking very straight, but you, you do. That's why you're here. You're the best of the best. I have to believe that. I'm the pastor of this church. I don't put anybody else down, but you're the best. That's why you're here. 
We give you milk, we give you meat, we give you everything. And some of you are going through marriage problems, financial problems, you got your own kid problems, and yet you come faithfully, and you sit here, and you're ready to receive the word. I'm telling you this word is to make you a better person. Not to puff your head up and say, now I know more. And then go and judge other people. Even the end time stuff. I've seen it for years. People are not open to end time because they use it in a corrupt way. We're the pre-trip camp. We're the mid-trip camp. We're the post-trip camp. Who cares? You're arguing over seven years in a span of eternity. Let's talk at least about the thousand years. How are you preparing for the millennium? Okay. We spent so much time on this. Again, I recommend a guide to the millennium. One hour on this. That's the focus that we're about on end time. Is you are getting ready to rule and reign. Are you qualified? Can you handle a little bit of knowledge? Can you handle Yeshua or are you going to go nuts over Yeshua? Can you handle the Sabbath or are you going to go crazy judgmental on other people? God must have such a hard time. You know, God had three revelations to give us in the New Testament. And it's a shocker. You think about it now, it's a shocker. Considering where the Jews were at, put yourself back in the first century. He wanted to say, I have a son. Can you imagine the heart of God? I have a son. Can I tell the world? Who can I tell? I have a son. My son is co-regent, is divine. His name is Jesus. Just three things. I want to tell you, I have a son. He is fully God. Although he's going to come down and live as a man with you. And, and here's his name. And just, just know his name and you get saved. How about that? What a deal. And that, those three, in the mind of God, of course in the mind of man, humongous revelation. In the mind of God, the tiniest revelation. It's like you saying, let me introduce you to my son. You wouldn't think twice. But God had to pause and think, what are the repercussions of this? Number one, I have a son. They have a war in Jerusalem and they took the Temple Mount and they built a dome of the rock with gold and inscribed there, God does not have a son. So since Islam has been invented in 600, around 600 AD, they have wars over whether God has a son. Then he says, my son is divine. Tells you ahead of time. I'll call him Emmanuel, God with us. I'll put God, plural, from Genesis 1. Elohim, not Eloah. And then, you know what people say? I got this two weeks ago. I was so sad. I hope he's repented. Somebody who follows my ministry said, I just want to tell you that God uh, doesn't have a son. He, he, and, uh, God has a son, but he's just like us. He's not divine. Jesus is not God. I said, well, John chapter 1 says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. You can't get any clearer. You know what he said? The Catholics wrote the book of John. What else are you going to take out of the Bible? Oh, he had quite a few. So you have to take all these things out of the Bible. I said, on what authority? He said, because the Catholics. I said, you have let your hatred for the Catholics blind you from the truth. It's because you're a product of your own culture. You come from Brazil. And Brazil has had bad experiences with Catholics and Jesuits. But does that define how you should walk your faith today? No, it doesn't. Your knowledge has corrupted you. There's a tiny bit of knowledge. I know the Catholics. Yeah, me too. My, my family are the highest ranking members of the Catholic Church in Thailand. The Pope would meet my family if, they, if he went to Thailand. I know the Catholics. I know the rights and wrongs. But my job on earth is not to be the judge. It's not to take that tiny bit of knowledge and then corrupt it and create division and hatred and anger. And I'm smart enough to figure out which part is the Apocrypha. You're a Catholic. You're supposed to believe with me everything in the Bible. Let's agree on that. Well, you add the Apocrypha. I'm no dummy. They ain't no Apocrypha. Jesus never quoted it. The apostles never quoted it. So why don't we just use our brain and say, that part I can't accept because there's no authority from Jesus or the apostles. 
But the rest of it, we agree. We even agree Mary is a special woman. Yeah? Blessed are you among women. Blessed are you. You are blessed. You are selected. You get to carry God in your womb. You're something special. You are. Are you the queen of heaven? No way. You're not. Because the queen of heaven is, is the antichrist spirit in the book of Revelation. Do I pray to you? Do I worship you? No, I can't worship no one but God. I said, but she's the mother of God. What about the grandmother? What about Anne then? You got Marie? Why don't we go back to Anne? What about the great-grandmother? I mean, how far are you going to take this line of thought? The only reason anybody in that family is special is because of Jesus. So you can't say the people related to Jesus are more special than Jesus. And at the, the wedding feast of Cana, they said, Mary, what shall we do? She didn't say, I will intercede for you. <laughs> Mary said, whatever Jesus says, do it. Meaning, I'm powerless. I can do nothing to help you. I can't turn water into wine. But maybe Jesus knows somebody who will sell you wine, or maybe he knows where to get wine. To let Jesus figure it out. What a mother. Totally respects that Jesus is not just her son. Jesus is a unique man sent by God the Father. You got Mark Zuckerberg, has a Facebook company, not even 15 years old. I mean, how, how, how young is that in the scheme of things? Within 15 years, become one of the richest men on earth. He had this idea in a dorm room in Harvard. I might have been in that dorm room. I've, I've, I've studied at Harvard, spent some, many, lots of time hanging out with friends in those dorms. So he has an idea. It takes off. Fif not even 15. What is it? 12 years later, he says, we are Facebook, 2 billion users. We are going to replace the church. Whoa. A little knowledge puffed you up. A little money. Well, you're, I'm worth a billion. Yeah, that's a little money for God. That's nothing for God. God wants to give you a billion. He can give you a billion. The problem is, he, he, to be honest, God has trusted secular people with a billion dollars more than he's trusted any Christian. And judging by the attitude that I have seen displayed in the church, I wouldn't trust many Christians with a billion dollars. I wouldn't. That'd be scary. They'd start their own church, the only one true church of Yeshua, Yeshua, Hamashiach. So all the people who can't speak Hebrew, I guess, are doomed. They should go to hell because they can't say Hebrew. I mean, come on, God made the languages. He's the one that made the languages. How, how silly is this going to look when we go up to heaven and all the languages are there? It's not just one language. So what I'm trying to do now is I'm praying that we have a business, that we have a presence on the internet, maybe through the form of a business, that challenges the monopolies, that is able to have um, free speech for all Christians, not just people in our church, that is able to create an economy for people who create wonderful music, art, sermons, talents, and we can create an economy that is separate from the world. Will it be big? Let God handle it. But it is such a danger if this gets fulfilled. Christians cannot handle money, cannot handle law, cannot handle accounting, cannot handle each other. They will say, why are you doing it? The, the criticism will come, for sure. What's a church doing with a social media enterprise? Why don't we have it? Why are they doing it that way? Why do they accept this and not that? Why do they accept this? Con it will be endless. Even the secular people are more sane than the Christians. The Christians will attack us on every comment and every response and reaction to every comment. We're not going to police it that way. That'd be nuts. That wouldn't be social media. But see, so what does God do? He says, I better just give it to Mark Zuckerberg. Because if you let the Christians involved, most of them will, will tear each other apart. So when it's outside of the hands of the church, guess what? Then everybody says, oh, okay, yeah, I'll pay Facebook to have that service. I'll pay for that ad. I'll pay for... So you'd rather give money to the secular world because you have absolutely no right to say anything to control them. That's the church right now. You look at Christian movie. This is the area that, that's crazy to me. 
If, if you dare as a Christian to make a Christian movie, you will not get applauses from many Christians. You will get vicious attacks for saying or doing anything out of the ordinary. So you've got the shack. And I bring it up because it's controversial and I'll get bad comments. So go ahead and do it. Prove my point. How crazy Christians are that God can't even give the power of entertainment to Christians. He has to give it to Hollywood. And you know Hollywood is corrupt. They're sexual predators. They exploit women. They exploit each other. But God says, I'd rather have Hollywood than Christians. You, you know why? Think of it from God's perspective. When somebody comes out with a Hollywood movie, no Christian criticize. You got no power. You got no say. So they come out with worse things, more soft porn, worse murders, more violent, and Christians pay to go see it. Some will vote with their wallet and say, well, I don't believe in Hollywood, I won't see it. But guess what? You have zero effect on the economy. They will still keep producing that. And once in a while, you'll get a nice Christian message hinted at in a movie like Ben-Hur. You don't even get to see the face of Jesus. We're like, oh, this is so good. We got to see the feet of Jesus in a Hollywood production. Awesome. Because it's made by Hollywood, you can't criticize it. But if it was a Christian church that made Ben-Hur, why didn't you show the face of Jesus? Why didn't you call him Yeshua? Why did you only call him Jesus? Why didn't he perform a miracle? Why didn't he perform a miracle on the Sabbath day? Like the Bible. This is unscriptural. Well, wait, wait, let me break it to you. Let me break all the... Because I'm not here to defend movies. I just want to tell you why we have no power, no money, no say in Hollywood and much of the government. Because God can't trust most Christians with the tiniest little bit of knowledge and power. Let me explain entertainment to you. Christians do not watch Christian movies. I asked the youth, I said, why don't you watch Christian movies? One youth was honest and told me the truth. She said, because I can always tell what's coming up next. Christian movies are boring. Why? Because you can predict what's coming up next. So what the movie industry does is they constantly innovate and think, how can we surprise the audience? What can we do that will create a twist in the plot? And so, the shack created a great twist. Papa sends a letter, and when you meet Papa, it's a black woman. Is that saying God is a black woman? I don't think it says that. But it's a technique of movies to keep people on edge and surprise. I know of no one on the planet who has walked out of a Hollywood movie and said, now I believe that God the Father is a black woman. Nobody believes that. They have more brain cells than most Christians. Nobody believes it. But you know what? I've met many people who said, I watched the shack and I was healed. I experienced a trauma. This guy loses his daughter to a rapist at a campsite. You take that on as a, as a challenging plot and you develop that, they did an excellent job. And people were healed of trauma. I know ministers, I know more than one, ministers who went through their own trauma, watched that or read the book and they came back to the Lord reinvigorated, fresh, and said, I'm not going to give up. People have been through bad stuff and I'm not going to blame God. I'm not the first one to go through bad things. You ain't either. And that's the heart of that movie's message. Now you watch, if I put this up on YouTube, I'm gonna get comments. I can't believe Pastor Steve uh, watched the movie, The Shack. No, I watch worse movies than The Shack. The Shack is not even that bad. The, all the Hollywood stuff that you're giving a pass are far, far worse. But I have a brain, I decide which part is good, which part is not. If you can't handle it, don't watch it. And this is the thing is, people bring their past and their experience and their sensitivities and then they generalize to the whole world. If you can't handle the, the um, what, how can I say, the show of flesh, 
in most Hollywood movies, you better not watch it. But me, I never really had a problem with porn. That's weird. I know. If you have a problem with porn, that's weird to you. I don't. I don't have a problem. I think it's disgusting. I think it's fake. I think it's contrived. I think there's probably lights and makeup and, you know, so I think, you know, did I see it as a young man? Yeah, of course. Of course I saw. I don't think there's a, a man in the room that hasn't seen porn. But does, does it affect me? Do, do I think about it? Do I go searching for it? No, I just don't really care about it. I'm happily married and I don't really think about it. So if I see something on, on a movie that, that is, you know, show a bit of nudity, it doesn't affect me. But guess what? It affects a lot of people, men and women. So you should not watch anything that, that would cause you to fall into temptation. But can you apply that standard to everybody? You can't. You have to learn to give people some leeway in life. Otherwise, the Bible would say, the 11th commandment is, thou shalt not watch movies. <laughs> it, it isn't there. So that means you now must judge based on your conscience, your past experience, your life, your sensitivities, what, what tempts you, what doesn't tempt you. You need to monitor yourself. So guess what? Christianity is, once you're saved, honestly, you police yourself. But what do we do? We don't police ourselves and we want to go police others. So Jesus says, updated version, before you go policing others, police yourself. Before you go taking the speck out of other people's eyes, take the beam out of your own eye. What's he saying? Police yourself. Why? Because I've made you born again. I put the Holy Spirit into you. You're supposed to go to church and learn the word of God. Therefore, you should have enough sense to police you. And the job, until you die, is try policing yourself. And if you can't even get that right, you can't even control your own thoughts, let's just give up policing other people. Let's just give people freedom to go pursue God and live a life for God in their own terms and let God judge them. Is that right? So there's incredible strictness in what we teach. And yet there's incredible freedom in what we teach because we're very strict on ourselves. But we're not very strict on anybody else. That's the way Christianity is supposed to work. Amen? Now we do this right, we're going to stay out of trouble when God gives us knowledge, power, and money. Which it looks like we're going to need all three to bring revival to this world, to conquer this evil world and get people ready for the millennium. Because the church is not anywhere near ready. The church is like not even, you can't even call the church infant. Now I'm, I'm thinking the church is still inside the womb. Maybe the rapture is just the birth. We are so infantile in our handling of one commandment. I mean, we're, we're going to go up to heaven and think, really? We stuffed it up that bad? Yeah, we did. One name we argue. One commandment, we argue. What do we do with money and power and entertainment? And power? Forget it. We can't even handle it. The last time it was handled fairly okay was when a concentration of Christians left the old world and went to the new world and said, let's try to start over on a completely different system. And they wrote the American Declaration of Independence, the most important piece of document other than the Bible, I think that's ever been written by mankind. And then they wrote the Constitution. And they had a lot of arguments. They, they were not all in agreement with each other. And then you know what the Christians argue about? Well, they're not even all Christian. Some of them are Freemasons. Some of them don't even go to my church denomination. Well, then I guess the very best example we've ever had on this planet, that is, you know that it's the longest lasting Constitution on earth? There is no constitution that has lasted as long as the American constitution. Russia's changed many times. Thailand, forget it. Every other year there's a coup. Right? Nobody has, has been able to govern a nation based on one document as long as the American constitution. That's why it's worth studying. But is it perfect? No. And many Christians will still criticize that. So you know what God says? He says, forget it. Let's just not have Christians be involved. Let's just have the secular world do all the laws in the Constitution and then the Christians can just sit and complain quietly. 
because you got no power to do anything about it. Imagine if, if you or I got the power to run a government. Imagine the hatred that will come on us, not from the world, but from the Christians. In our attempt to reform, I would reform the taxation system, the justice system, the education system, based on the Bible. But seeing that most Christians can't, don't even know heads or tail in the Bible, don't even know how, what, what, what does the legal system look like in the Old Testament? I think almost nobody knows. Do you know that in the legal system of the Jews, which is based in the Bible, you are not allowed to treat two cases in the same way. Meaning, whenever, if you're a judge from God, you must treat everybody who comes up before you as an individual, and no other case is to be compared to that case. And so what have we done as a Gentile world? We flipped it on its head and we did the opposite. We said, we're going to build a whole justice system based on precedence. So how easily can lawyers corrupt the whole system? Well, the law is written this way, but they say, oh yeah, but there's a precedent that way. Well, there's a precedent for every other angle that you want to take. Because no two situations are the same. But if you're trying to relate it, you will allow for manipulation. Which is how the lawyers talk and make money. It's, it's, if you study any of this, you could reform a nation. You could reform the justice system. You could reform the economy. You could make almost everybody rich again. But instead, we're in this system where God says, I would allow the world to control the Christians more than Christians control the world. The worst example actually is, and now I'll come to the to people who don't like the Catholics, I understand why. The last time Christians, so-called Christians, and they, they were not truly born again, most of them, but so-called Christians had a lot of power was when the Catholic Church made kings. The kings had to be anointed by the Catholic Pope. And they raised exorbitant taxes on people, called it indulgences. If you pay the Catholic Church, you can buy your grandmother time out of purgatory. Absolute evil. Just an excuse to tax people. And then they used it to build the basilicas and the wonderful tourist sites that we go see now in the Vatican City. This, that's what happened. And then anybody who disagreed with the Catholic Church, who supposedly had pure doctrine, they're no different than the ones that think they have pure doctrine today, they tortured them. They, you know the torture back in those days? Unbelievable. They would tie you up, and then they tie the other end of your leg to a horse and hit the horse, and the horse would run until it rips you in half. They, they, and they invented torture machines to quarter you. That means split you in four while you were living. All because you disagreed doctrinally. Can you imagine if the King James only people had that kind of political power? You'd be quartered in a millisecond. You'd be dead. Because the hatred they have for any other translation is visceral. I love the King James. You're, you're talking to somebody who loves the King James more than any other version. But I ain't going to kill you over the King James. And I ain't going to hate you over the King James. You see what I mean? So we're going to try, for as long as we live, as long as we have church here, to be a real church that is able to treat people with love and respect even though we have a little knowledge, a little power, a little money. Now we're going to help each other and be real Christian. Amen? Not only do I thank you for watching, I'd like to ask you to share this video if you enjoyed it. And if you haven't already, please subscribe and click that little bell next to subscribe to get notifications. Thank you very much. And God bless you.